This episode of the Modern Therapist Survival Guide is brought to you by HealthCasters. The HealthCasters is a podcasting course and community designed for therapists in private practice and therapists turned coaches and consultants that supported the successful launch of over 270 podcasts. Learn more about the HealthCasters at sellingthecouch.com forward slash join the HealthCasters and enter the promo code Therapy Reimagine at checkout for $100 off the listed price. Listen at the end of the episode for more information about HealthCasters. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Widhelm with Katie Vernoy, and this is part three of our special series, Fixing Mental Health Care in America. And if you have not yet listened to parts one and two, please go back and listen to those. And we'll include links to those in our show notes over at mtsgpodcast.com. When we look at mental health care in America, part of what Katie and I were looking at is the various ways that people needing mental health services interact with all the various systems. And today's episode, we're focusing on psychiatric emergencies and the ways that clients, patients, people in general in psychiatric emergency situations end up in the emergency room. And so our guest today, once again, interviewed separately, spliced together. So our guests are James McMahill, who works in Minnesota, and Casey Yoon, who formerly worked in an emergency room in Los Angeles, California. We are joined by James McMahill, licensed marriage and family therapist. Currently, I'm in the crisis response team in Carver County in Minnesota. It's a western suburb, just right outside of the Twin Cities. How do emergency rooms end up being a part of the mental health system? I have such a arranged experience from having conversations like these about emergency rooms or about law enforcement, you know, because each system is such a fingerprint from one another. One ER is so distinctly different from another ER. My experience when I was a director of an outpatient program in San Diego is so different from what I experience on a day-to-day basis in the Midwest. For the most part of what I experienced as a clinician, it is a, it's essentially a holding place for someone who has usually come in for a medical issue and then is witnessed by the attending MD or nurse to also be endorsing an issue that's synonymous with a mental health concern. And in the two ERs in particular that I work with, they have become so used to referring out to the crisis team that even if someone is coming in and stating that they're experiencing depression or anxiety in any way, generally will lead to a mental health assessment by the crisis team. Once that's completed and we've made a recommendation, then the ER becomes much more of a complicated place because then they're kind of Uh, particularly if we're recommending an inpatient like treatment program, then the client is just kind of hanging out in the ER until we are able to secure a program for their ongoing mental health care. And so there's this kind of tension following a disposition between the crisis teams and other hospitals who have short-term residential or short-term behavioral health units and the two ERs that we serve in who do not have behavioral health units in trying to get them to an appropriate level of care kind of as soon as possible, because the ER is always concerned about how many beds are available, who's coming in, what the tenor and the mood of of the unit is. And so it's kind of a holding place for that moment. We're also joined by Casey Yoon, LPCC, talking about some of the experiences of working in emergency departments when it comes to mental health. So thank you very much for joining us and spending some time. Tell us how emergency rooms work as part of the mental health system. My experience, the emergency room is often the first kind of net or door into a line of resources for mental health in the community. It can be kind of the first step that patients and their families or people take when someone's having a mental health crisis. But on the other hand, I've also seen the ER function as a then catch-all net for individuals whom the system doesn't know what to do with. And so sometimes it's the first door 
that first kind of introduction to mental health and resources, but then it, it also becomes kind of this catch-all. So the person that's in transition or can't utilize their resources or, or in between resources, they also begin to use the emergency room as well. So what do you see when it comes to there's somebody brought in by law enforcement, typically uh-huh. under a 5150 type situation? Right. Walk me through what that might look like. If we were observing this from somebody entering the door, working through the emergency department staff until the the psych staff gets there, what is this experience like for somebody going through this kind of a crisis? That's a great question. I have often wondered that, how alarming it must be, depending on what symptoms are being presented. But there is a lot of noise and a lot of chaos when you come into the ER, depending on the day. But most of the time, that's what's going on. So you're coming in usually with law enforcement or fire, you're coming through the double doors, you're not coming through the waiting room, you're not being triaged the traditional way. You're coming in and everyone's looking at you, right? Because the attention is shifting. It's just busy. And on top of that, you're you're getting rushed through the triage. And I think things are happening so fast. And I've often wondered how it must feel to be someone who's experiencing a mental health crisis to then be to be in this situation. It's difficult for a person who's not experiencing a mental health crisis. I was thinking right? that exactly. And yes. even if somebody's coming in with some sort of a, an injury or a severe illness, mm-hmm. they might also be having a mental health crisis as well. But when the yes. primary symptoms are psychosis or suicidality mm-hmm. or homicidality, like it seems like it would be hugely disorienting. Yes. And then you're your triage, you're put into a bed, and they tell you a bunch of commands, you know, change into a gown, take off your shoes, your stuff is taken away. And then you're maybe left alone. And then the doctor takes however much time to come see you, they're asking you a bunch of questions. And then sometimes you might get visited by a social worker, if you're lucky, you'll get a kind nurse who has some idea of what you're going through. And then after all of that, after all the questions, all the stuff, all your stuff has been taken away, you're essentially told that you're on this 5150, then it's just quiet. You know, the only people that come in to check in you is shift change. If you're in restraints, maybe someone comes 15 every 15 minutes to check on you. And then meals. And then you're just waiting. Like after all of that barrage of communication, then it's just quiet for however the rest of the time you're in the ER. So that sounds really overwhelming. I could especially (laughs) imagine for folks who are having psychosis or or other psychotic symptoms, Mm -hmm. like it would just seem like, especially I just, your stuff getting taken, you know, like, wow, you know, just such a, I don't even know the right word, just very, a very vulnerable time. Right. You know, you're, you're rushed in, you've got all this stuff happening. What is the goal I mean, obviously there's an assessment to to get to the 5150, but what's the stated goal for the next 72 hours for these folks? I think it depends on the hospital. So if you're a designated LPS facility, which means essentially you have a locked inpatient unit, your goal is to wait until a bed becomes available. If you meet the criteria, which is, you know, this whole other barrage and maze of things. If you're not at an LPS designated hospital that has a locked psychiatric unit, then you're waiting to be transferred. And even those kind of progress updates are very few and far between. But I just wonder about that too, right? You come in, all your stuff is taken. You're told that you're waiting for a bed somewhere else. Like, I mean, what if you have no idea where you even are, right? If no. you wandered somewhere in a psychotic just mess. And then now you're kind of coming to and then they're telling you, oh, we're going to ship you to some hospital that's 40 miles away. You don't know anyone. So just wait for that. You know, yeah. it's so hard to deal with. On this piece about trying to get people placed, when somebody has entered into an emergency room, there's a whole bunch of different departments who are either responding on the emergency side, waiting for psychiatric to come in, What's the turnaround to getting somebody into one of these programs that you're talking about? I mean, that really waxes and wanes. It depends on kind of that bell curve of utilization. You know, usually as you approach the weekend, the ability to get someone into a short-term BHU goes, you know, it goes way, way down. It's a lot more difficult. So it, it really just depends on what's going on out in the system. You know, we have a database that shows all the available hospitals, all the available programs, and all of the available beds 
And so once we've made that determination and recommendation for an inpatient program and the attending physician agrees with that decision, then it still rests on the crisis team to do, quote, unquote, a bed search, which is to page the different programs within the region to try to find someone availability. We will do our behavioral health assessment in that moment. And until we get that completed in a way that's representative about what's going on with the client in its best way as possible, the client's just going to be kind of hanging out there in the ER. And then we make that presentation of the behavioral health assessment to the different programs to review. Then it is completely up to the whims and the mood of the different behavioral health units that we are sending that packet to for review to determine whether or not they think that that client would be a good fit or not a good fit. And so there's this odd kind of back and forth between, oh my goodness, you know, this person has got a lot of severe issues versus, and this isn't as big a problem for me as as maybe some of the other clinicians of, do I try to write this in a sellable way? So we don't get the person who's reviewing the client to be like, no, 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 no. we're not, we're not going to be taking someone who's physically aggressive and struggling with schizophrenia or any kind of psychosis. So it is really difficult to kind of find that balance between, okay, we've, we've addressed the emergency situation. We've got backing by the attending physician. And now our job is essentially to find a place that will accept that client. And that's completely based upon our write-up. It's based upon our ability to communicate with the, the behavioral health unit in a friendly and, and charismatic way to kind of get <laughs> them in the mood to, like, to, to accept the client. And also just what the complications of the system are at that time. What has been your experience with the kind of revolving door? I think all of us have kind of heard about mm-hmm. the ER being used both for medical, but it also sounds like mental health crises, like that's where care happens. You know, the people yeah. just that revolving door, this is the catch all, the landing yeah. pad for folks. What has been your experience of that? What does that actually look like? I think it depends on the relationship that the client has with the staff, to be honest. You know, I think there's some clients who utilize the revolving door of the ER and it's it's almost like a it's a homecoming every month, like, oh, they're back. And you know, like <laughs> they know the system, right? That's the kind of client that's not gonna complain. They're gonna give up their possessions willingly, they'll do all the labs, they get it, you know. Mm-hmm. But some clients are more difficult, more aggressive, and it just, it almost becomes not this mentality of, oh, we can treat them like crap because they, they come here all the time, you know, mm-hmm. versus the kind of client who comes in and they get treated a little bit better because they might treat the staff better. For me, it's difficult because it almost compels this sense of defeat. Like, oh, they're back again. I thought they got connected with services. So it, it, I'm torn. There's some clients where I did it. It's almost like you don't mind when they come back because they know how to operate and you almost enjoy seeing them and catching up with them. Right. But yeah. there's also a large majority where it's difficult and it's difficult not to become resentful and think, oh, well, this patient's just abusing the system and abusing our resources. It's not that you don't want to help, but I think when certain clients come in every month, you assume that they either don't want the help. Or yeah, you assume they don't want the help. And so you don't advocate for them. Really, you're just trying to, you're waiting for them also to get transferred upstairs because you just think to yourself, well, you'll be back anyways. You're you're not really going to change. You're not really going to get help or seek treatment. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's a much larger issue, or at least it was for me in Southern California than it is in Minnesota. It really impacts those who are unable to advocate for themselves, who are homeless, who are untreated in a much different way than it does the Western suburbs of Minnesota. There isn't a ton of homelessness in the suburbs of Minnesota. The response of those who would be picking folks up and doing emergency transports, for example, is just a lot different depending on what kind of ER system that you're working with. So when I was in San Diego, it was a much bigger issue. We had folks who would be picked up by PERT or who would be picked up by law enforcement on a weekly basis to the point where they would become regulars in the ER and regulars in the the short-term BHUs in the area. And that in itself also creates kind of this interesting relationship because when, when people become known in ERs and their high acuity, but also like presenting with a high degree of affability 
there's almost a lowered bar for those folks to be admitted into the ER. And there's this kind of friendship relationship. Oh, so-and-so is here again. Come on in. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. We'll get you, we'll get you all taken care of. And yet there's nothing after that, really, for those folks who unpaired to long-term services, regardless if it's because just voluntarily they feel better once they get out of the ER and they've had their immediate needs met and they don't want to engage in any kind of outpatient programming or act level programming. And so I know that there's a lot of discussion and a lot of work going on right now with quote unquote involuntary outpatient programs or mandated outpatient programs, particularly in Southern California. I don't see that as much in in Minnesota as I did in, in Southern California. In an earlier part of this series, Senator Henry Stern was talking about expanding the 5250 part of the law and being able to hold some of these clients longer and and beyond freedom and freedom, uh, being able to essentially add a week, a couple of weeks that would, I'm assuming under his system, would be reimbursed for the hospital. With more time and some of this treatment, do you think that that would help to alleviate some of the revolving door aspects that we see? That if mm-hmm. so much of this priority seems to be patch them up and ship them off. Right, right. What is treatment in these situations? Some of these repeat customers that you've seen just in some of your experience, is there just that uh, that little bit more of stability that would alter their lives. Yeah, I think the time, uh, I definitely think it would help with stability and stabilizing the symptoms, or maybe just getting the right mix of medications for certain patients. And then they could also be watched and monitored to see if they have side effects. I think the other part too, is that it gives a chance for the case manager or the discharge planner to try and work out viable placement for some of these folks. You know, I think it's difficult to try to find someone a place to live if they're only in the hospital for, let's just say a 72 hour hold, three days to, to have them interviewed, assessed by someone from a home and then for them to be accepted. I, yes, I know it's, they'll be waiting essentially in the inpatient unit, but at least they have some time, you know, it's not so hurried and the case manager can really work on Let's find this person a home that they're not going to get kicked out of, or that we can hopefully pay for rent for a little bit longer than a week or so. There can be a bunch of different goals, depending on who's working within the mental health system. You know, kind of the hot potato syndrome of this particular client is too difficult or for us to meet our program or funding goals. This can happen between administration and treatment. How do you, in your experience, how have you seen this kind of stuff played out? It's a constant battle against the idea of, yes, I see that they need help, but no, this isn't the appropriate place for them to get that. And so you see that across modalities, you see that across presentations, you see that across programs who have identified as having a specific scope. I know I experience that on a daily basis as an administrator of an outpatient program when dealing with someone who... At the time, we were wrangling with the idea of, is this person substance primary or is this person mental health primary? And so there was often kind of that passing back and forth between programs of, yes, I understand, but that person doesn't feel appropriate to our program. From an emergency room standpoint, some similar things go on, but it's much more about the folks who are providing services in that moment, the nurses, the doctors, the the aides, the watchers. Um, who are concerned with what someone who is potentially coming to their BHU or how that person will disrupt their milieu or how that person will disrupt their system. And so uh, the, the folks who are high acuity, the folks who are really struggling and really the most vulnerable are those who end up spending the most time in the least therapeutic of spaces because we often have such a hard time finding them or finding a, a program who's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we are well equipped to deal with that and, and we can absolutely provide them with services. I mean, I don't get that response when I'm when I'm letting folks know that the person is really struggling, they they've been sober from methamphetamine after a, a year on and they're struggling with hallucinations and paranoia and physical aggression. Like I know immediately that I'm more than likely going to have a very difficult time finding that person's services. And meanwhile, they're languishing in the ER in a, in a box room. And so 
that's really the tension. That's where the hot potato for me lies in, in the ER of who is willing to accept this person and serve this person and give them the help that they need. So when you're talking about this cross-training between emergency staff and, and psych staff, and part of this even gets into the training of the people who are bringing people in, like law enforcement yeah. or ambulance and paramedic type services, what kinds of training inadequacies from the psych perspective are you hoping that some of these other services would be able to have, or what do you see as deficits that they have when they are working with patients who are coming in under these kinds of circumstances? I saw that quite a lot, unfortunately. You know, I think it's one of those things where, again, it's it's very much about how do we not take responsibility for this person, this human being that we're bringing into the emergency room. For law enforcement, if they're not criminal enough, or if it's not just, if it doesn't fit into the standard or protocol for them to take them into their custody, they kind of bring them into the ER. And then for fire, I mean, fire is even more broad, right? So I, the inadequacies I saw a lot were just a very loose interpretation of LPS. And that's the Latterman Petra short. I always forget the what it stands for, but just very loose interpretation of what it means to be a danger to yourself, a danger to others, greatly disabled. That's a I mean, you can take all kinds of license with that, right? And I think with fire, it was also difficult because I think oftentimes the intention is good. Like if we give them to an ER, then they're gonna get set up, they'll at least have a bed, they'll have some meals, and then the ER will take care of it. But you know, there were so many times even with fire where even just bringing someone's wheelchair, that would be forgotten. I don't know if that's necessarily a deficiency in training, but the ER doesn't have an abundance of wheelchairs that they could give to this patient once they're discharged, right? So I think mm-hmm. even things like that, how do we see a patient as a whole person who has a life outside of the ER and yes, who may need help, but that doesn't necessarily mean their rights should be taken away and then they're just left on the street, essentially afterwards. How does the lack of substantial mental health training by law enforcement, fire, et cetera, the, so the, the lack of knowledge and training for the folks that typically work with you, how mm-hmm. does that affect clients? I alluded to that image of impatience. And I think that that is what occurs the most when I'm dealing with law enforcement or emergency responders who are untrained in issues of mental health. Because Part of what law enforcement goes through on a daily basis is to address a criminogenic narrative, right? And it's really easy to get lost in the the who, what, where, when of that narrative. And so I often see untrained law enforcement trying to apply that same structure to a mental health emergency. And that doesn't mix well with someone who's having Uh, an incongruent internalized process to what it is that they're also trying to communicate with their words or with their actions. And so when that messaging is mixed or is affected or impacted by what experiences someone's going through, there's that impatience and there's that tension and there's a dismissal that says, well, what you're talking about is not a big deal, right? Or there's that immediate kind of sense of we've got bigger fish to fry. And so meanwhile, I am seeing someone who is potentially responding to stimuli, who is exhibiting severe negative symptoms, who might be having an associative event because of trauma history. And it's so it's difficult to have to have a, a conversation with someone who hasn't had training in that regard. They're like, hey, there's more going on here than what's on the surface. And I think we need to kind of slow the pace down um, and really explore what it is that's going on. And so it's that time and impatience thing that really, I think, creates a rift between the practitioners who are out there as first responders and and law enforcement or fire who are out there trying to do the same thing. So not only is there needs differences, but to this bottleneck that you're talking about, that there's policy implications into creating this bottleneck in California, where Katie and I are a lot more familiar with things. You bring up George Floyd, you're talking about this much more intertwined relationship between law enforcement and mental health where you're practicing now. With the current environment, the current changes, the defunding the police sort of discussions, 
How do you see that being implemented with the kinds of systems that you're interacting with now? And is there really as much of a push for that where you're working compared to some of the experiences that we're seeing here in California? I was stunned at the difference in working with law enforcement in the suburbs of Minnesota as I was working in East County, San Diego. My outpatient clinic was in El Cajon, California, and to be frank, that police department was fairly well known for a quick temper and quick decisions and a lot of impatience. You know, even when they were coming into the clinic on those rare occasions that we did need to call law enforcement and PERT was not available, I had some really poor experiences with law enforcement. And so I I, I don't know what the current climate is back in Southern California, but you know, when I came here, and I don't know whether or not this has been a change due to what happened in Minneapolis, but I started a couple of months before the George Floyd murder. And since then, there has been kind of a combination of things. There's one law enforcement. And again, depending on what officer you're dealing with, depending on what deputy you're dealing with, or sheriff you're dealing with, or sergeant you're dealing with, and, and depending on what their mood or what their experiences it have been on that day. But overall, the amount of collaboration and the amount of uh, requests for me to come out and participate in a law enforcement event with someone that's struggling with mental health is way above what I experienced in Southern California. We're getting calls quite often to come out and, you know, I'll arrive on scene and and the, the officers, deputies will kind of tell me what the situation is. And they're always kind of waiting to see whether or not this is something that I can take care of on my own and give them the clear or whether or not I want them to stick around because there's concerns about violence. But there is a surprising level of patience that I'm seeing in dealing with law enforcement in Minnesota. Um, And for me, that patience has always been the most crucial element in those, those crisis bubbles, right? Because if you have an increased amount of tension with law enforcement and you can feel the resentment about having to be there in that moment, uh, it makes for a really difficult situation. And it very rarely results in a positive outcome for the client or a positive outcome for the therapist or for law enforcement. But there have been a couple of episodes here where, where law enforcement was willing to work for hours with a client trying to figure out levels of safety, trying to figure out levels of cooperation. And I've yet to have a situation devolve into something worse than it was when I had arrived. You know, I've, I've had positive outcomes with law enforcement in, in Minnesota. Now, there's a lot of problems here. <laughs> yeah. That is not to say that that's not the case. Obviously, that's the case. I mean, so far in my personal experience of working with law enforcement as it pertains to them wanting us to join and potentially give them space to remove themselves from a mental health situation, I've had pretty positive experiences. Now, whether or not that's driven by altruism or driven by their desire to depart, that I don't know. (laughs) There's a number of times, especially if there's mass shootings or other things, where there's this public outcry for more funding for mental health programs. Sure. And it's usually during some sort of a tragedy. What are your thoughts on those, those outcries? You know, usually the expectations for me in those times is to fully understand that in that, in that month, in that bubble, whatever that is, is that there's going to be the least amount of potential progress on actual mental health change than any other time, because it is used as such a, such a red herring argument by folks who are looking for a distraction away from something that they don't want to talk about. Someone You know, if someone wants to make sure that they don't have to talk about gun control, they'll say, this isn't a gun issue, this is a mental health issue, and yet have very little desire to actually change anything within the mental health world. And then on the flip side of that, you have folks who may actually care about there being fundamental changes in mental health, but there needs to be this prioritization to having a conversation about gun control. And so they're kind of stuck in this space of saying, well, Yes, I mean, we should talk about mental health, but let's not get away from the issue that that dude in 30 seconds just mowed down 20 people with an assault rifle. And so I always cringe in that moment because I know that there's going to be 
the least amount of productive conversation about mental health as of any time outside of that window of a tragedy like that. Part of the administration process is around this LPS designation of yeah. hospitals. And you've had an experience where a hospital kind of walked this line that contributes to some of this placement process, especially for longer term treatment. From your perspective of working in these kinds of departments, there's some of these admin kind of decisions that then end up affecting even some of these clients' ability to reliably even have the emergency room be part of their safety plan. Give us a little peek behind the scenes as far as what you've seen as some of these kind of policy level decisions that affects even just the accessibility of care for people going through situations where they need to end up in the emergency room for psychiatric reasons. I wish I could be a fly on the wall in those meetings. In my experience, the first three years I worked in the ER, we worked with an inpatient unit that was LPS designated. So it was locked. So if a patient did come in on a hold, there was almost an immediate transfer or at least pending bed placement upstairs. So they had somewhere where they could really be stabilized and treated by psychiatric staff. Somewhere in between that time, I'm not quite sure. All I know is there were very many audits because when you're LPS, Department of Mental Health, obviously they're, they want to make sure things are running. They want to keep people accountable, but it would be, a, it seemed like a very big burden of responsibility on the psychiatric staff. I felt like it was every quarter they were being audited because we were designated. There was that reason. There was also a higher number of patients with admin days when we were locked because we're waiting for higher levels of placement. And afterwards, we decided to forego the placement, the LPS designation, and we became a strictly volunteer, voluntary psychiatric hospital, which still had beds, but we could no longer take patients that were on 5150 holds unless the psychiatrist came to the ER, discharged the hold, and then had the patient sign voluntary. And I think that made it, it's hard to say, because then at that point, the, the 5150 patients were either wait, they waited the 72 hours in the ER, and then they just got discharged with some paperwork, or we transferred them to a locked unit where I don't know how long they would stay there. But it did become difficult because it's almost, it almost feels as though there is very little you can do at that point. If someone comes in, you either transfer them or you wait and then you discharge them or they go upstairs. You almost want them to sign voluntarily, but sometimes if they don't have the cognitive abilities to understand what's going on, or they're in such a state where they can't sign voluntarily, then you're just either again, waiting it out or waiting to transfer them, which can be difficult. So due to the bureaucratic, not, you know, nightmare, Mm-hmm. as well as it sounds like some of the the really hard requirements, this smoother system of they come into the ER, we have a place for them, mm-hmm. became this weird convoluted, maybe we can take them, but right. somehow they have to not be eligible not- for 5150 anymore. Right. Yes. They can't be too <laughs> acute. They have to be acute enough where there's criteria. So, you know, yeah. they're suicidal enough or homicidal enough or psychotic enough, but not so much where then they're 5150 material because that's a, then we have to call a pet team from a different hospital. Or, and then that's when they end up like 40 miles away, not knowing anyone. Yes, yes, exactly. And I, the hospital pays for those contracts as well with certain lock. If once you're an unlocked hospital, you can pay for contracts with locked hospitals so that they will then take your patients, especially the ones that are uninsured, you know, or with county Medi-Cal. Yeah. It just seems like it becomes these silos again when it was integrated in the hospital when you first Mm -hmm. started. Right. This whole reimbursement aspect, like you're talking about Medi-Cal or uninsured people, Mm -hmm. but even for some of the insured people, what are some of the difficulties as far as a program of getting reimbursed that potentially even contributes to this whole fiasco? I think, well, one of the difficulties I experienced in the emergency room was the emergency room is technically outpatient. So then to have a psychiatrist, let's say from the inpatient unit, 
come in and do a consultation every 24 hours for a 72 hour hold, you know, depending on the psychiatrist, it was difficult to get them to come down there because it's an outpatient service. And I want to say it gets a little confusing with billing and then how do they get reimbursed as an inpatient provider for an outpatient service, which is also some of the barriers I experienced when we were in meetings about creating a psychiatric emergency room because our hospital was in talks about that for a while. But I think, again, there was just too much red tape, bureaucracy stuff. And a psychiatric emergency room is the fine line between outpatient and inpatient, right? Because they're not, they're not, they're getting treated, but they're not inpatient or they're waiting for a bed. And I think eventually administration didn't really want to go through with that idea. It's so interesting that ERs are considered outpatient when right. especially recently, I'm assuming a lot of people were staying in beds for days. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's almost like psychiatric illness shouldn't be treated entirely like a medical problem. Yeah. I want to go back to this question, you know, since we're talking about, you know, some of this idealized care and we asked it at the beginning, but even when it comes to the way that administration and reimbursement happens, are, is there more that you think needs to go into this idealized care sort of answer? I think so. I mean, I don't, I don't even know what that would look like. Sometimes I have these, I used to have these daydreams in the ER of, oh, what it would look like if we just had psychiatric staff and there wasn't this revolving door, but it's such a, it's a part of a system that needs help. You know, the, actually the episode with the Senator and then the medical director of GMH was, I was so enlightened and I was also given so much hope by that episode because I was thinking, yes, this is like, it needs to be a system thing. The ER is part of that system. I don't know if obviously it could start with policy, but it's sometimes I feel like it's just a smaller part of a much larger problem. And so part of the system being that places like the ER, places like the prison, Mm -hmm. um, the jails that end up serving as de facto parts of the community care that has lost its funding over the last several decades, that um, proper reimbursement, as I'm hearing you say it, is actually funding some of these community places to take care of people before and after some of these crises. So that way they're not sitting around waiting three days for a placement when Mm -hmm. there's no placements that can be found. Exactly. I think that's very true. You know, I don't have that much experience with it either, but even a psychiatric urgent care, there's not that many. Um, I think the main one I know about is the line of Exodus urgent cares for mental health. Mm -hmm. And then there's a new one that was recently built in Long Beach, but even having that, and they also have their time constraints. Supposedly, patients can only stay for 23 hours. I don't know who came up with that number. And then they get Less discharged. Than a day. Yeah, or they get transferred. And long before I started in the ER, they, they would tell me stories of there was an exodus connected to our emergency room. So they would discharge a patient from the exodus or urgent care, transfer them on a gurney, basically down the street to our ER. And they would kind of just ping pong them around because they didn't know what to do with these patients. And so, yes, I think proactive care before and then actually having sustainable and viable treatment plans after would be immensely helpful. Well, I'm also hearing having some way to be comprehensive in how people can do services where the billing isn't by the minute Yes. Based on type of service. And I even mm. think the whole issue of inpatient versus outpatient and can you bill for both services on the same day? Like right. It just seems like there's also insurance bureaucracy that needs to be addressed because mm-hmm. people are not doing the best care they can because they won't get reimbursed for it. And they're right. being incentivized to treat and street. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I, it's and I was actually talking to a psychiatrist the other day. What did I ask? I was thinking I was asking about, you know, what was his experience like working in the emergency room? And it's difficult because I think a lot of them are inpatient psychiatrists. There's usually, I don't know, one group that's seeing inpatient psych and a detox unit if they have that, which was the case at my hospital. And so getting someone to come down just to see a patient out of 5150 it was never fast enough for the ER doctors, first of all. And it was difficult for them because, you know, they're 
they're either going to discharge a patient or they're going to treat that. Are they going to come every day? The patient's there. And I think that was difficult as well. Seems very patchwork. That's a great way to put it. Very patchwork. And I feel like I was always scrabbling to put pieces together and within a very finite amount of time. And everyone was always asking, well, administration was always asking why, why is this patient here for so long? And what, what are you not doing to either get them upstairs? And it, you know, it can be very frustrating. Well, I guess the question ties to the reverse, which is how hopeful did you feel when someone came in with a mental health crisis that they would stabilize, get back to their life and things would be good going forward? Like how sure were you that they were going to get the care that they needed? Honestly, (laughs) I think it would depend on some factors. I think if they came in with a family member or a friend or a roommate who was concerned, and I could tell that they could get connected after I would have my hope would increase if they came alone, they had no resources, no family, no social support. Then I would almost think, well, there's a good chance they're going to be back. But there's, there is some hope in that too, right? Like I think when I first started working in the emergency room, I was so shocked by how much the ER becomes a part of some patient's treatment plan. They just know, right? They know, I don't know, in the middle of the month, I'm probably going to have some kind of psychotic breakdown and I'm going to come to the ER. I think that would affect how much hope I had. What do you see as an ideal for how ER services would be working with in relation to how they fit in the larger mental health system? Because it sounds like as a, as a catch-all or sometimes mm-hmm. even the first, first door, mm-hmm. it may be really the wrong match. So how do yeah. you think it should fit in to the mental okay. health system? You know, ideally, I would, I think the ER should operate similar to how it should operate for just medical patients, which is for mental health crises and emergencies. Ideally, there would also be things like more psychiatric urgent care centers where there's kind of this other level before they get triaged as an emergency or a crisis. And I think too, it'd be great if in the ER staff, maybe nurses or whatnot, we're cross-trained on how to deal with mental health crises and mental health patients. Every single ER is dealing with mental health, right? And so I understand you don't need an extensive amount of training, but it's always divided between the ER staff and then the psych staff that comes in to help and support. So it's almost like this, oh, the psych nurse will take care of it. And so the ER staff, whatever training they got in nursing school, let's say that's kind of it. So that would be another ideal if there was just more cross-training involved to deal with mental health crises, if that's what the ER was, of course, in my ideal, if that's what it was being used for. I think in in an ideal space, and I always dream about this whenever I'm at the ER and I'm really struggling with that tension of freeing up the ER bed, is that I would love to see a mirrored space, a space that is identical in in every way to the ER, but is staffed with nurses who are trained specifically in mental health, that is staffed with psychiatrists as much as it is PAs or or medical docs, and a place that's really conducive to that moment of stabilization until you can get someone to a program that will better serve their needs than the ER. Because, you know, the ER fundamentally is about stabilization and about uh, creation of, of safety. And so in particular, when you're dealing with a psychiatric crisis, a lot of times the moment that that occurs, the environment in which we're going and seeing the the rooms for clients that we're going and doing crisis assessment, it's a, it is a safe room, you know, quote, quote. So it's a, it's a bed and it is four walls and it's a locked door. And so there's so many incongruencies to what it is that I'm trying to offer in that moment, which is real human connection, which is true visibility, which is, you know, making sure that that moment or that person in that moment knows that they're being heard and they're being seen and they're being treated by someone who has their best interest at heart. And meanwhile, I'm doing it in this hermetically sealed cube. And so I'd like to see a psychiatric ER. That's where, that's where I would like to be treating the clients that I'm doing the assessment with. How would a, the job for a clinician change in the ER if this system were quote unquote fixed, if people actually were able to, that it really was crisis or first door 
not ro- not revolving door, not you know catch all. Mm. How would that change how it feels to be a clinician in the ER? That's I really like that question. I honestly have never thought about that. I mean, I, I, in moments because you're just there's so everything is time, and so you're just like, oh my, I just have to go out assess this patient and get them out of here, or have a plan for the doctor because he doesn't want to deal with it. Mm-hmm. How would it change? I think there would be more care. I mean, I'll speak from my own experience. I think when I saw patients who were truly in a mental health crisis, and maybe even some of those that were revolving door when they would come in and they were really having a hard time, I think it would just allow for more care, even in that kind of chaotic setting. If we're the first door, the first net, or the first landing for these kinds of patients, maybe it wouldn't have to be so chaotic and so hurried maybe they could feel like this was the right decision they made and it's safe. For me, that would be one way it could change. But I have to think about that a little bit more in terms of, I guess I've just never thought about that. What it would be like if we weren't responsible for just getting them out as soon as possible. So now it's our turn to reflect a little bit on what we heard, close it out. But I was very struck by how similar the perspective was, even though we've got folks that are working in two different areas in the country. I think the the desire for a psychiatric emergency room with the training, the resources, that person-to-person connection that could be possible. I really liked that vision, but I think as as you and I have talked about a number of times, it's huge systemic changes that are going to need to be to happen for that to really be the case. And it's often with a part of society that gets overlooked as far as being a worthwhile investment. And that's part of why Katie and I are putting this whole series together is it's something where looking at one particular space in the system as it's being isolated away from everything else doesn't do it justice as far as how we look at fitting everything together. In our interviews and some of the stuff that got left on the cutting room floor, especially James was talking about some of the stark differences that he had seen between his work in Southern California and his work in Minnesota. But despite all that, there just seemed to be more similarities than not, especially when it comes to where the shortcomings of the system is. And through the remainder of this series and our continued advocacy work of improving mental health in America, I'm hoping that by putting all of this into context, we've got a really good opportunity for some calls to action for some good systemic change. So keep listening. We've got more episodes that'll be coming out soon. And by soon, it could be in a month or it could be in three months. We're trying our best to put together really solid interviews so that we're putting together a nice whole. But if you have ideas to share for our Fixing Mental Health Care in the United States series, please let us know. Check out our show notes at mtsgpodcast.com and we'll include links to the previous episodes as well as some information on James and Casey and also a Welcome to our growing team of Alyssa Davis, who helps make some editorial contributions on this episode as well. Until next time, I'm Kurt Woodhelm with Katie Vernoy. Thanks again to our sponsor, The HealthCasters. I wanted to tell you guys a little bit of what's included in the HealthCasters podcasting course. It includes simple step-by-step videos to take your podcast from idea to one that generates income when it launches. Also includes cheat sheets and templates Dr. Melvin Varghese uses for the Selling the Couch podcast, whether it's scripts to reach out to guests or templates to let guests know that a podcast is live. They recently released the podcast episode tracker. The simple sheet helps to keep your podcast episodes organized, whether you want to reference them later or repurpose them for content in the future. You can also choose to upgrade the purchase of the course to the community of over 250 other therapist podcasts. This includes monthly group one-on-one coaching calls with Melvin. And you can learn more about HealthCasters at sellingthecouch.com. Join the HealthCasters. Enter the promo code Therapy Reimagined at checkout for $100 off a listed price. And just a reminder that sellingthecouch.com forward slash join the HealthCasters. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. 
Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. 